Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Janika Gelinek, and I would like to welcome you to the Literaturhaus Berlin tonight. The day before yesterday, I received an email from uh, an acclaimed German author and a friend of the house saying, I would love to come to the Deborah Levy reading. I've read everything by her, and I can't tell you how much I adore her. But I've just noticed that there are no more tickets. <laughs> how can I get in? I'm happy to sit on the floor or stand in the back of the room for an hour and a half. I would be, it would be so great to be here. <coughs> Did you make it? <laughs> I think that's pretty much the spirit of tonight. And we will always try to match such enthusiasm. So thank you for coming in such a big crowd. But I'm also aware that you have to have Deborah Levy on stage to evoke such an enthusiasm. <laughs> so dear Deborah, I think everyone here in the hall is very happy that you're here with us tonight. Can we have a big applause? <laughs> But as much as we admire her, it would be even nicer if someone had an exciting and interesting and competent conversation with her. For that, we have invited the author and translator, Katie Derbyshire. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. And Veronika Bachfischer from the Schaubühne Ensemble will read the German text for us tonight. Great to have you here as well. And, yes, <laughs> last but not least, I don't know if anybody is hearing her. I want to give a very warm thank you to Lilian Astrid Gese, who's doing the German simultaneous translation tonight. <laughs> so, I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Janneke. Oh, welcome to the desert. I'm really excited to be here. I do. I'm going to skip my introductions for Veronica and uh, Lian because you've already heard about them. We're not going to do 90 minutes. I'm so sorry. Um, and I'm going to move on to, to the star this evening, Deborah Levi. Am I pronouncing it right? Levy. Levy. I'm only going to say it once. <laughs> She's the author of acclaimed novels, short stories, and plays. She's written for the Royal Shakespeare Company and dramatized Freud's two most iconic case histories for the BBC, Dora and the Wolfman. Her novels, Swimming Home, Hot Milk, and The Man Who Saw Everything, published by Camper in Germany, were nominated for the Booker Prize. Her living author autobiography, the Cost of Living and Things I Don't Want to Know won the Prix Femina Etranger, while Real Estate, the final volume of that trilogy, was awarded the Christopher Isherwood Prize for autobiographical prose. Her new novel, I think we're probably all looking forward to it, August Blue, will be published in May of next year. The person who is not here this evening, I don't think, is, is uh, Marion Hertler who lives in Munich, and she edits and translates, including Beautiful Mutants that we're talking about today, and also Swallowing Geography, plus amazing writers like Tija Jin, Edna O'Brien, and Patricia Highsmith. So uh, here we go. Um, I'm just going to start. We've got to go right back to late 80s England tonight. I do apologize for everyone who experienced it the first time around. <laughs> Uh, for Beautiful Mutants, which was a, a State of the Nation novel published in 89, so written... Um, I, I was about 20, 25, 26, when I wrote Beautiful Mutants. Um, <clears throat> I was wearing silver platform boots, a lot of eyeliner flick, <laughs> like so, and it was my very first novel. I had been writing for performance and theater. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, before then, and, um, and it was written on a typewriter. So I had a, a 
piece of A4 paper with carbon paper in the middle. Like my daughters, they don't know what carbon paper is. Smoking. <laughs> like so. Um, maybe I had an image in my mind that I was like um, Martha Gellhorn, the, 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 the incredible uh, war journalist reporter, yeah. and war reporter. Um, <clears throat> Because you would see the guys, you know, the men, uh, photographs of them on typewriters, always with a cigarette. I think I was in that sort of mood. And I was furious uh, because this was, as you say, the 80s. Um, there was a whole new culture of greed that had come into London, my city. Um, <clears throat> so the experience because I'm not a journalist. This, this, this isn't really social realism. Maybe it's social surrealism. Yeah, that's a good do description, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, was that suddenly there were many homeless people on the streets. Um, now in London, there are still many uh, homeless people on the streets, but this was, this was kind of new, younger people who was who was sleeping uh, rough, and um, and then <clears throat> mental health mm. uh, had been um, all, all funding had been taken away. So 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 people who who uh, were frail um, and had mental health vulnerabilities they were on the streets yeah. too. So this was new. You have to go back you know, all those years ago, and suddenly this is what you were seeing. And so um, <laughs> so I set to work on Beautiful Mutants. That was the mood of it then. Um, and I had to, I had never written prose before. Right. What, what was it that made you switch from, from playwriting? Yeah. Um, so, so, Veronique, you, you'll know this, you know, theatre is very collaborative. Everybody uh, is, is making the, the show together. And um, I just remember being with a big ensemble of the actors I loved, the, the director, the lighting designer, the sound, and desperately wanting to be alone. <laughs> feeling that I wanted to um, roll up my sleeves and get my hands on language to be in control of my meanings without discussing them with Veronica. <laughs> or Veronica having to discuss them with me, you know, um, because I, hadn't, I, I knew nothing else. Uh, the one thing about the theatre, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Veronica here, because I'm so honored that she'll be reading from, from some of my book. Um, what I learned in rehearsal was how to edit very quickly as a, as a novelist, because if you write a, a weak line for a skilled actor, you hear that line die in their mouth in front of you in, in rehearsal, and you're so ashamed. So you quickly go, ah, oh, just one minute. Uh, try, try, try this, and, the, and, and you, find it, you find a better line, you know. So now I, I, can, I, I think I can hear that when I write and, um, and can edit quite, quite quickly. Mm. It, um, it, it, it was difficult for me to read it without thinking of, of where we've got to today. There's a lot of the, the characters. There's, a, there's a, um, a man who doesn't have a, a name apart from his function. That he's, he, he's kind of gone up, a he's moved up a class, and, and he seemed to me like a proto-Brexiter. Yeah. Do you, do, when you read it now, how That's does that true. feel to you? Yeah, he's a proto-Brexiter. <laughs> Uh, so it was enterprise and nationalism. Mm. That was the, the, the sort of beginning. Um, so yes, he had working class parents. Um, 
but he has no ideology anymore yeah. at all. So I was interested in that. Um, uh, yeah. You, the, where was it that you wrote it? I wrote it in London, and some of it I wrote in a barn in the countryside that, um, that a friend had, had lent me for a while uh, to write my first novel. Yeah. Oh. Uh, on a typewriter. Yeah. 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 So, so the book has this, this very disparate cast of, I'm calling it a cast, because I think it's still quite close to it a play is, in a way, yeah. of, of all these different characters from, from different class backgrounds, from, from different um, nationalities. The, the narrator was born in, in Moscow and she came to England as a child. She has a, a, a poet friend who's also from elsewhere who, who works in a frozen hamburger factory. Uh, there's the, the proto Brexiter neighbor who, who works at the, the newly computerized, back then, stock exchange. There's an artist, a sex worker with three kids. Um, there's a very rich and very angry banker. Female banker. Female banker, that's important. Yeah. Um, and so they all interact, and, and I found I had to read it very closely. I, I enjoyed reading it the second time, even more than the first time. Um, but most of them are women. Yeah. Can you remember how you, how you put that cast together? And there's the anorexic anarchist. The actual anorexic anarchist. <clears throat> uh, well... Um, so it's my favourite. So, so, I'm, so, so I'm looking at um, capitalism as I understand it there. So I'm looking at buying sex as a commodity. I'm, I'm, I want to give the sex worker character an inner life. I want to give her a domestic life. Um, the anorexic anarchist... Uh, she has sort of taken the pain of the world into her own body, was what I was thinking at, um, at that time. Um, Lipinski, uh, so the first line is, my mother was the ice skating champion of Moscow. That wouldn't read so well these days, <laughs> right? But my mother thought that was a great line. She was an ice, cha ice skating champion. I think it was the, f the favorite line I'd ever written as far as she was concerned. You could have stopped then, couldn't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I needed Lipinski to come from somewhere else, somewhere that uh, wasn't Britain, as a stranger to, to this culture. Then we have the poet who also works in a factory. So when I say it's social surrealism, um, she's, she's working with the meat, and the meat on the conveyor belt starts to take on the shape of her thoughts. So maybe as an older writer, I might have asked, well, what do this, what shape? <laughs> what, 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 shape are, what, what are the thoughts yeah. that are making the shape? That would be interesting. But no, you know... Um, uh, so, so I look back on this book, Katie, I look back on it as the beginning of making a language. Um, that's always what a first book is about, making a language, laying out your, maybe laying out some of the obsessions that are going to be developed mm -hmm. with more nuance and finesse later, something like that. Um, walking female characters into the center of the world. Um, hey, I could do it, you know, in the 80s. I could just, that discovery, they could just be in the center of the world. Yeah. That the thoughts were valuable, were valuable to me. Yeah. That I could maybe, um, you know, transmit those thoughts to, re to readers. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. We're going we're gonna to hear a little bit of uh, my only Atlas translation. Do you want to give us a few words to uh, introduce it while Veronica comes okay. to so, read? Um, the, the female protagonist has a boyfriend called Freddie, and um, 
Freddy goes to London Zoo to um, have a conversation with some of the animals there. I'll put it like that and reveal more later. Heute Abend herrscht Jupiter, der Gott der tierischen Metamorphosen über die stinkenden Tiergehege im Zoo. Urin und Scheiße rinnen in einen Ring aus Wut, einen Ring von sternenloser, mondloser Nacht. Die Wut von Tieren, eingesperrt von einer unbeholfenen Kultur. Der Geruch von Knoblauch liegt in der Luft, wabert von den Gorillakäfigen herüber, der Schweiß von Bildern hinter den Augen, unter der Haut und in den Rissen von Lippen. Im Reptilienhaus verschlingt eine Python zwölf tote Ratten. Ein Mungo frisst einen Skorpion mit Sandstachel. Die Elefanten heben ihre Rüssel und brüllen über London hinweg. Und die Müllfahrzeuge sammeln die abgelegten Häute des Tages ein, um sie zu den Öfen zu bringen und zu verbrennen. Freddy liegt außerhalb des Lama-Käfigs auf dem Bauch. Er ist voller Schlamm, Matsch und Würmer und das Lama, sehr golden und mit sanften Kurven, bittet ihn zu sprechen. Wo sind deine Worte? Ich bin arbeitslos, sagt Freddy. Das bedeutet, dass ich keinen Platz habe im Plan der Dinge. Keine Rolle, in die ich morgens schlüpfe und die ich am Abend wieder ablege. Ich gehöre zu der hungrigen Spezies und ich bin allein. Ein Fremder in einem vertrauten Land. Ich habe keinen Ort, auf den ich meinen Kopf betten kann. Auch keine Schenkel, zwischen die ich meinen Kopf vergraben kann. Keine Schulter, keinen Schoß oder Konzept. Keine Tasse des Glücks. Keine rote Rose, um meinen Kopf darin zu vergraben. Keine Anstellung irgendeiner Art. Hm. Arbeitslos? fragt das Lama. Ach komm schon. Es gibt Milliarden von Jobs für eine Hure. Warum nicht Gas geben? Den Bleifuß aufs Pedal. Wie wäre es mit ähm, einer Karriere in der City? Stürz dich auf die Stadt wie ein hungriger blauer Wurm. Finde den Wurm in dir selbst und werde er. Innovation? erzeugt Erfolg und Erfolg erzeugt köstlichen Hunger jeglicher Art. Wie genießt du deinen Kummer, Freddy? Geh, geh ins internationale Finanzwesen, werde Verkäuferin in einem wachstumsstarken Computerunternehmen, werde Vertriebsleiter, Marketingmanager, Business Analyst in einem milliardenschweren Unternehmen mit Krankenfürsorge und Umzugskosten. Zieh deine Ambitionen gleich mit um, zieh selbst um, von hier nach da und darüber hinaus. Zieh deinen Kopf um. Und du wirst zigtausend zu Hause finden. Aber, mein Freddy, ich, ich, ich weiß nicht, wie ich das alles anstellen soll. Ich weiß nicht, was überhaupt aus mir werden wird. Ich bin verloren, Lama. Verloren und verloren und verloren. Wie stelle ich es an, ein Rädchen im großen Getriebe eines Konzerns zu werden? Oh, du Hure von einem Sohn. Sei ergebnisorientiert. Denk an Hypothekenzuschüsse und Boni. Sei ein Macher. Du musst auf Profit abzielen. Lern zu sein. Du brauchst Enthusiasmus. Niemand investiert in Depression. Streng dich an und du bekommst das richtige Paket zusammen, weil du der Richtige dafür bist. Aber zuerst könntest du emigrieren. Ja, pack deinen Kopf zusammen, dein Herz und deinen Willen und zieh in eine andere Gegend. Man nennt es... Und lass diese Worte jetzt mal über deinem kaputten Kopf leuchten. Die echte Welt. Das Lama kichert. Lama, ich verteidige die nackte Wahrheit der Träume. <lacht> die nackte Wahrheit der Träume. Oh, Freddy, du bist wirklich ein komischer kleiner Kerl. Eine komische kleine Blume. Freddy vergräbt seine Zähne im Schlamm und sieht zwei Affen beim Lausen zu. Die riesige Panda-Dame starrt melancholisch ins Nichts, während sie an einem Stück Zuckerrohr kaut. Moskitos sirren über ihrem Kopf. 
Von welchen Träumen sprichst du, armer Freddy? Die Augen des Lamas werden größer. Früher, früher hatte ich Träume, Lama, aber ich habe sie verloren. Ich suche in Gärten nach ihnen. Es scheint, als wünschte ich mir eine Familie. Wusstest du, dass bei den Seepferdchen die Männer die Jungen zur Welt bringen? Ja, sie bekommen wen, wickeln ihren Schwanz um einen Pflanzenstängel, winden sich unter Schmerzen vor und zurück, schlimme Krämpfe, bis sich ihre Bäuchlein leeren. Ich habe schlimme Krämpfe und kein Baby. Ich will ein Baby. Du schweißt ab, sagt das Lama und scharrt mit den Hufen in der Erde, scharrt den britischen Boden auf. Wir sprechen von Unternehmen. Warum nicht ein Babysyndikat gründen? Wenn Sie eine Familie wünschen, gibt es Hardwarefamilien und Softwarefamilien. Was bleibt mir sonst noch, als Vater zu werden? Ich werde mit meinen Kindern im Park schaukeln gehen, zum Schwimmen, sie in den Schlaf wiegen, Bananen für sie zermatschen. Freddy, ich fürchte, du sprichst von Familie im allgemeineren Sinn. Meinst du vielleicht Schwesterlichkeit? Brüderlichkeit? Das Lama streckt seine Zunge raus, um eine unsichtbare Fliege zu fangen. Freddys Tränen fallen wie Kiesel in den Schlamm. Ich weiß nicht, was ich will, Lama. Ich möchte so gern glücklich sein. Lama Freddy, du bist vom Weg abgekommen. Hast deine seidigen Hurensinne verloren. Ich muss gestehen. Ich mag Leute, die vom Weg abgekommen sind. Ach, verpiss dich, Lama, mein Freddy. Ich will doch nur geliebt werden. Das Lama kratzt sich am Ohr. Du wirst, du willst geliebt werden? Au, au, aber kannst du denn lieben, Freddy? Erinnerst du dich an die Frau mit den Lilien, wie sie für dich gesungen hat? Wie du eine Blume in ihrem Strauß geworden bist? Und wie du sie ins Verderben gestürzt hast? Nicht, weil sie dumm war, sondern weil sie mutig war. Ich sehe sie jetzt mit deiner Tochter, ihrem kleinen Kind der Liebe. Sie ist es, die ihr Kartoffeln brät, ihre Schaukel anschubst, ihre Kreiden, Papier und Knete kauft. Deine Tochter formt grüne und blaue Daddys vor dem Fernseher und die Frau mit der Geige, die Mutter deines Sohnes, hat ihm Turnschuhe gekauft, hat ihm die Geschichten gezeigt, in denen er sich selber finden konnte, hat ihn mit in die Bibliothek und ins Kino genommen, ihm zum Einschlafen Lieder auf ihrer Fiedel vorgespielt. Und wo warst du, Freddy? Hier bei mir? Auf der Suche nach deinem Kopf? Wünscht dir Kinder, die du schon hast? Entschuldige, Freddy, ich habe einen Stein in der Pfote. Wenn du nicht lieben kannst, dann verändere deinen Zustand radikal. Ja, bediene Systeme, die Kummer produzieren. Ja, dadurch wirst du zumindest gut im Hassen statt schlecht im Lieben. Ein Babyschimpanse zieht an der langen, schwarzen Brustwarze seiner Mutter, die seinen Kopf in ihrer Armbeuge hält. Ihr Mund öffnet und schließt sich im Rhythmus mit dem Säugling. Lama flüstert Freddy. Ich habe versucht, mich zu verändern. Ich, ich weiß tatsächlich, dass die menschliche Natur eine Erfindung ist. Ich habe versucht, mich neu zu erfinden, aber ich, ich muss gestehen, dass ich das kleine bisschen Macht, das ich auf dieser Erde habe, nur sehr, sehr widerwillig aufgebe. Ja, ich, ich weine schon wieder und ich weiß nicht, wann ich je damit aufhören werde oder warum. Es sieht so aus, als gäbe es gar kein Gras mehr, auf dem man träumen kann kann. Ich leide, Lama, und ich brauche jemanden, der mir hilft. Habe ich denn wirklich alles verpasst bei meinen Kindern? Ich versuche, von Frauen zu träumen, die mich geliebt haben, aber sie weigern sich zu erscheinen. Ich will Seelenfrieden. Ich, ich will Frieden, aber ich, ich, ich weiß nicht, was das ist. Irgendwas, wodurch ich dieses, dieses Zeug loswerde, das in mir drin, die, die, die Angst, die Tränen, dieses Zittern. Ich, ich würde Schüsse abfeuern und Bajonette durch Fleisch treiben, um mich von mir selbst abzulenken. 
Ich würde peitschen, quälen, ringen, Rennwagen über Klippen fahren, um mich von mir selbst abzulenken, aus Helikoptern springen, Handgranaten werfen, um mich von mir selbst abzulenken. Ich würde marschieren, rechts, links, rechts, Befehle aus der Kehle brüllen, Befehle in meiner Kehle gehorchen, um mich von mir selbst abzulenken. Ich würde Muskeln aufbauen, von denen ich nie wusste, dass ich sie besitze, um mich von mir selbst abzulenken. Das Lama schließt die Honigaugen. Ihr Bauch hebt und senkt sich, als wäre ihr Atem ein sanfter Wind. Er lässt das Salz auf Freddys Wangen trocknen und jucken. Er bemerkt drei Karten, die an ihrem Käfig hängen. Auf der blauen Karte steht Geschichte, auf der weißen Verhalten und auf der rosafarbenen Gesundheitsakte. 10.15 Uhr, Exemplar klingt, als würde sie leicht husten. 10.40 Uhr, Exemplar hat ein wenig Flüssigkeit gespuckt. 13.10 Uhr, Exemplar ruhelos. 13.40 Uhr, Exemplar hat Bauchkrämpfe. 14 Uhr, Exemplar liegt auf dem Rücken, grunzt regelmäßig. 14.30 Uhr, keine Veränderung der Position. 16.10 Uhr, Exemplar wirft ihr Gewicht gegen die Käfigstangen, wirkt aufgebracht. 17.10 Uhr, Exemplar zeigt Anzeichen von Nasensekret. 17.30 Uhr, Exemplar zeigt keine Reaktion auf Lärm. 17.45 Uhr, Exemplar verweigert Nahrung, Augen geschlossen. 18 Uhr, Exemplar rennt und fällt gelegentlich. 19 Uhr, Koordination des Exemplars deutlich besser. Speichel um den Mund, falls Zustand unverändert, morgen Abstrich. Bist du krank, Lama? flüstert Freddy. Bist du krank, Freddy? flüstert das Lama. Ich glaube, ich glaube, vielleicht bin ich sehr krank, ja, Lama. Und, und Gesundheit, das kann ich mir nicht leisten. Lama lächelt gönnerhaft. Die einzige Freiheit, die du hast, Freddy, ist mehr Zucker zu wollen. Ich bin keine Barbarin. Ich komme nicht aus deinem Land. Durch eine Reihe von seltsamen Umständen wurde ich hier eingesperrt. Wie seltsam, dass ich dir nun die Hieroglyphen deiner Kultur erkläre. Oh Gott, heult Freddy. Oh Gott. Er sammelt Schlamm auf und isst ihn. Lama, vielleicht könntest du, könntest du einfach meine Arterie hier durchbeißen. Erlöse mich von meinem Leiden. Meine Zähne sind stumpf, sagt das Lama. Der Zoowärter hat sie abgefeilt. Freddy liegt auf seinem Rücken und lauscht auf den Ruf der Eulen in der Nacht. Der Löwe schließt die Augen. Er träumt, er liegt im Schatten einer Akazie. Der Klang eines Klaviers aus einem unsichtbaren Teil der Stadt weht in die Bilder hinter seine Augen hinein und wieder heraus. Für den Löwen ist das der Wind. In seinem Traum streift er zu einem nahegelegenen Wasserloch, doch es steht in Flammen. Feuer über Wasser. Der Geruch von brennendem Fleisch weht über das lange, ausgebleichte Gras. Er öffnet die Augen. Das Gras ist zu Asphalt geworden. Thank you, what an amazing reading. I loved the way you brought out the humor. And, and I hope you all heard that, that humor coming right there, right through. I also love uh, Marion Hertel's translation. I love those grüne und blaue daddies. That's a decision that she made there, I like that. Um, and you write in, in Real Estate, the, the third part of the autobiographical trilogy, you write about, about the difference that being translated has, has made to your work. And, and your writing life. Mm, can you understand any of the other languages that you're Not translated much. into? Not really. But I can, I, I can hear the cadence. Yeah. I can hear the rhythm. And, um, you know, um, the, the point of writing for me is to reach out into the world. Yeah. Um, without translators, I am nothing. That's the truth. I would just be speaking to my own island, 
um, and um, to really reach out to to you is the whole point of my writing life. So I am indebted to translators. They have my, um, they have all all my respect. Uh, really, we can hear we can hear the simultaneous translation happening here. I love hearing it, you know, because I think this is really where we are in the world. Is sort of whispering, <laughs> trying to trying to find the right word for this feeling, for this idea, for this thought. Yeah. Um, this is the endeavor of language. It's beautiful, yeah. Oh. Well, let's, let's hear a little tiny bit of the English pre, pre-transformation. <clears throat> tell, us what, tell us about what you're going to read. I just read one very short paragraph, okay. So we've just had this amazing reading. Uh, so here's the thing about translation. My publishers, my distinguished publishers in the German language, Aki, have, have translated and published my first book. And they will trans uh, written at 25, and they will also publish. Aki will also publish the book that I've just finished, age 63. So if we just look at that journey, uh, my 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 th- you know heartfelt thanks to to my publisher, because that is just an incredible thing to have my first book here tonight, with all its fury with all its mistakes, with all its spirit, and to have my most recent book um, translated in the German language is, is, um, that's the journey from here to there. Um, So I'm just going to read just a paragraph, a character called the poet. And the poet can, metamorphize, she can change shape. So she can become a llama. She can become the llama that Freddy uh, was speaking to. And that's who Freddy was speaking to. Later she can become a fish, she can become a salmon. But she is also um, very human. In the slum cities of northern Europe, she lost her health. Coffee cups in greasy cafes offered her dark and difficult visions. And then she lost her mind. She lost herself in the architectural, rational, cultural, political structures of northern European cities and began to vibrate with confusion and pain. The poet mistress, the skill of metamorphosis. She learnt she had to become many selves in order to survive. If she had no identity, she would have many identities. She learnt she was engaged in a war and saw how those who are confused and in pain or who have some secret sorrow of their own bring out an instinct in others to crush them, humiliate and hurt them. The poet refused to be crushed. She waited for the storm inside her to be over. And when it was, in the parts that were torn, she planted sunflowers. Now we were we were speaking backstage um, about bodies, and I, I hope you noticed how Veronica's whole body was was doing that reading, and I I know that you have a little bit of dance training, right? No. No. <laughs> oh no! But it's not completely wrong. I had a theatre training. Right. I, I trained to be a playwright, and in that training, um, we had to do. Uh, what was called movement, and what was then called contact improvisation, uh, with an incredible tutor called Steve Paxton. 
uh, who had trained where he he'd, uh, he'd danced with Martha Graham, he's American. He had collaborated with Rauschenberg. Um, he was incredibly famous, and all us 18-year-olds turning up, we had no idea. And what we had to do was we spent, um, so I was a very bookish uh, young person, and suddenly um, I, I'd chosen not to have a, 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 do a degree in literature, but I was writing and reading, and uh, my head was full of short stories, but Steve, our tutor, he didn't care. Off come the <laughs> shoes, and we had to just walk. We just walked across the studio for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then we had to fall up and down. And we had to look at, consider how the body was aligned, what part of our body we lead with, so in so so in Britain, there's this phrase. Um, she has her nose in the air, like mm. like someone who's arrogant. Okay, so it's possible that someone can lead with their nose. Okay, or you 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 know that's uh, maybe if someone's shoulders are stooped, that they lead with this sort of stoop with the shoulders. We had to consider how our feet, how gravity works because we were doing lots of falling. Mm. To this day, I can do great falls. <laughs> Always Use, handy, using yeah. the Using the, the, the body the, to, to catch yourself. Yeah. So, yeah, I could do it right for you now, but I won't. Um, and how did this affect my writing? How did it affect your writing, yeah? In so many ways. Because I was learning a language that was entirely new to me, um, I couldn't really work out why I was there doing this training. But uh, in, in writing, we have to embody ideas. We can't just have, you know, or, or we, we can't just have theory that we're interested in. Like I read a lot of, of really dense and difficult theory. For me, it's rock and roll. I don't understand a lot of it. Um, but um, that's that's why I read it. And um, but you don't want you don't want um, you have to embody ideas. You have to embody characters. Yeah. Because in the theatre, you know the characters come to you already dressed. They have a costume. They have uh, an inner life that has been worked out in rehearsal. Uh, but you have to do all of that on the page. But you have to kind of... Um, so unless it's going to be very dry, you want sweating, trembling, laughing. Or, or the characters have to be very embodied. Yeah. Yeah. They, they certainly are here in, in yeah. Beautiful Mutants. Definitely. And I think that in all my work, actually, that training... Yeah. Is is sort of there too, yeah. and objects. The image does a lot of the work for me too. In in all my work, um, they do a lot of the speaking. Uh huh. So what I mean is, in the man who saw everything, um, it, which is a novel about a very loving but careless man. Um, he loves, he, he has sex with men, he has sex with women, he's careless with both, he doesn't take enough care, but he's, he's complicated, uh, and he, ha he is asked to bring a tin of pineapple oh. when he visits the DDR yeah. in 1987, and it's very important to his host that he brings the, the, the pineapple, because it's hard to find in that his host's mother wants to make a cake for her daughter's birthday, but he forgets. So the tin of pineapple has to carry quite a lot of information about him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's clever, yeah. And uh, Virginia Woolf said, uh, objects carry long-held histories and emotions for us. So... Um, 
you know, it might be that you, you that in your ha- home you have something that you project everything into. Um, longing, memories, anxieties, whatever. Objects carry these things for us. So I'm fascinated by, by that. Yeah. 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 Tell us a little bit more about Berlin because you just mentioned that um, the man who saw everything is, mm. is set here in 87 and then later. Yeah. Did you, do you, do you come often? Are you a regular visitor? Yeah, I did, I did come often f- to write that book. Mm. Um, in fact, that book um, really started um, with that fo- famous photograph of Honecker and Gorbachev kissing mm. that I think you, everybody knows. But in Britain, all the newspapers, when I was 29 now, had that photograph. In the, on the front page, and I remember buying every every single newspaper and cutting it out, and I put it in a folder, and I did nothing with it, and then, many years later, I wrote the book. So it's very interesting, you know, this this weird process yeah. of 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 writing that book. Yeah, yeah. it Berlin is pops in. With a, with a slightly different meaning in this book as well. This just pops up, the wall. It because, does. of course, it was, it was such a big thing it was, in yes. the, at the time. Um, I know what I want to ask you about is, is writing and parenting. Because when you wrote uh, Beautiful Mutants, you, you weren't yet a parent. Mm. Have you found being a parent to be a, a productive constraint or, a, or an inspiration or a, something or do you really have to work around or well do male writers get asked this question oh no you're so right but I, I mean, did for, I did but, but be careful because I did no but I didn't but, ask about mothering you didn't but but I will answer it because it's fair it's, a, it's fair enough um you know, I think all, all artists have constraints, and obviously children are going to take up a lot of your, your attention and a lot of your physical energy. Um, when I wrote my novel, Swimming Home, I wrote that when my children were young. I wrote it through the night. I'd been a, I used to write early in the mornings. That was over. So I was going to write late at night. It became nocturnal. And I used to write until... Um, a car alarm went off at four in the morning, every night, four o'clock. Ah, there's the car alarm, good. Um, So, maybe there are, um, a a writer uses everything, really? Yeah. that, That happens to them? Yeah. We are changed by everything. Um, thankfully. Um, but what's much more important is uh, the, the motivation to make ideas manifest, really, in art in, in, and in literature. Mm-hmm. That, strange, that strange thing that we do. Um, you have to like solitude very yeah. much. I'm also a very social person. Um, but you have to have an appetite for for solitude. There's no such thing as not writing alone. Maybe sometimes in the theatre, um, it's less so. But you still have to go back and 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 figure it all out. Um, You're right. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna open the floor if anybody has any questions. I'm not sure if we have a microphone or not. Uh, here comes Janika to tell me the answer to that question. Thank you. So um, I have more questions if you don't, if you can't think of anything, but if you can think of anything, now will be the perfect time to put your hand up and make good for that stupid question I just asked. Ooh. There's a question uh, Hello. next to Daniel. Yeah. Magic around people 
I know you're coming back 30 years later after you've read a um, uh, whole bunch of other novels. Like, how did it feel for you? Did you find the text that you expected to find? Or were you surprised at what you actually found in front of you? Yeah. So did you hear that question? Yeah. Uh, I was really surprised to to read it again. Um, um, so I'm surprised at its audacity. You know, I'm really glad it's not a sensible book. <laughs> because why would you do that at 25? If you're writing like a 50-year-old at 25, something's wrong. So I, I'm sort of on side, if you like, with with the younger self that wrote the book. With all, it, it's got mistakes. It's got things that um, it's it, it's it's finding out how to how to make a language, and so I'm enjoying the spirit of it. I you know, and sometimes you think, oh my god, and then other times you think, yes. Yes, um, so it's a very mixed. It's a very mixed feeling to come back to your very first novel, you know. And you have to be forgiving. I don't mean indulgent either, but um, you know, it's, it's an odd thing. I keep using this word, making a language, but you know, there was all this controversy about Bob Dylan uh, winning the Nobel. Uh, but it was when Patti Smith sang A Hard, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, that I really heard the language. It was so weird. It was the way that she sung it. I suddenly heard the excellence of that language and the strangeness of it. Like this uh, line, um, a highway of diamonds with nobody on it. A ladder in water with a hand bleeding. Um, and I thought, yeah, <laughs> he's making a language. <laughs> <laughs> Patty, Patty taught me that, you know, Patty Smith, the, the the way she cadenced it in this crystal clear way, um, suddenly made me much more interested. And I, I thought that prize was right. Um, so what can you say? You you have you you. I look at it now and I think, well, I've learned a few tricks <laughs> since this book. But it has a spirit and a history, it's, you know, that, um, that makes me happy, actually. Yeah. Could you, could you please speak up? Our one microphone broke down so they can oh. go over here. Just yell or go up there. <laughs> Yeah. And if this was a sort of starting point for your writing yeah. of the book, if you have a sort of pattern that you can see with all of your novels, that sometimes there's this kind of spark to a picture. Yeah. Because you're also a playwright, and maybe there you would probably start with the people talking. And I, I was just wondering what your process there was. Yes. Um, it often starts with image. So, um, in August Blue, which is the title of my new book, um, that I think Aki published in July next year, and in Britain in May. Um, it starts with uh, a young woman in Athens at a flea market buying two mechanical dancing horses. And that was something that I saw, and I knew that as these horses danced under the blue sky of Athens, I knew a book was born. Um, <clears throat> then they're very practical things. For my novel, Swimming Home, um, the central, a, a, a lot of it takes place in a swimming pool. And so I had to think, well, what is a swimming pool? Like, physically, actually, what is it? 
and um, it's a hole in the ground at its most basic. That's what it is, a hole in the ground covered in water. So it's sort of like a watery grave as well. And then I thought, a swimming pool is also like a theater because we wear costumes and um, we have exits and entrances. And there's all this behavior in swimming pools because I'm a swimmer. You know, people are aggressive or they, they swimming too slowly. Um, so all, so that really interested me. I could not write Swimming Home without knowing that the pool, without researching how a pool is physically made, what it is structurally, just a hole in the ground. That still fascinates me. I don't know why. <laughs> so, so an, an image of often, yeah. Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, hi, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you've spoken a lot about different European locations. Obviously, Berlin has come up. Yeah. And you just mentioned Athens, and obviously, hot milk is set between Spain and yeah. Greece. And yeah, so I was just wondering, obviously, there's the kind of, yeah, the obvious prism of Brexit, but maybe if you could talk more about what the relationship between the continent and Britain means. In yeah. Yes, sorry, that was it. a quick question about um, the relationship between Europe. I have forgotten the question already, but Europe and Brexit, I think. Why do I set my novels um, in Europe, I think, is, is the question. Thank you. Yeah. That's a really good question. <laughs> I've, I've thought about it a lot. And um, I like to take British people out of Britain <laughs> and put them somewhere unfamiliar, somewhere else. That's how it works for me. And um, so Henry James did this, and Forster did this, you know, Took, took Americans out of America and put them in Italy and, and um, to, to sort of look at them more closely um, away from the habits and the comforts of, of home. So I think that is really my game too. Yeah. Um, but I always have Britain in it. So... This, this is really almost entirely set in Britain. At that time, we just couldn't travel. <laughs> it was the 80s. You know, it was, just, it was, so, it was so hard to, to travel. These days, in the, in, I, I don't know about here, but in the gap year between school and university, all the kids go off to sort of form their character, paddling in canoes in South America. <laughs> like for my generation, absolutely no way. Uh, my father had three jobs to support his family. I worked in a cinema. I was scooping the ice cream, tearing the tickets, making the popcorn. And that's how I met Derek Jarman, the filmmaker, because we were screening Jubilee, which is actually, a, I think, an influence on this, in a, in a way, sort of got the same kind of... Mm imagined territory, sort of flamboyant, Im, 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 flamboyantly imagined territory. I don't know, my friend, what it would take to set a, an entire book in England at this moment in time. I think I would find myself writing about, I think I would feel very, um, I will never say never, actually. Maybe I will. Thank you. I think here you, you have Lipinski, who is from elsewhere and looking mm. with, with kind of mm, yeah. unaccustomed eyes as well. Mm. Yeah. But think of Marx and Engels, how well they wrote about Britain. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, another question?
So Let me very quickly do the question for the for these people. Sum it up about the experience of coming from South Africa to Britain as a child and whether it's still with Deborah. Yeah. So if you're born somewhere else, uh, I left South Africa when with my family when I was nine and grew up in in Britain. So I feel more British. Um, on the other hand, you know, when, we, when I arrived at school, age nine, um, I didn't know who the Beatles were. Um, I'd, I hadn't watched the television programs that the kids I was at school with watched. That was a big deal. There were, there were no televisions. Um, I'd come from a whole political history. I'd come from different weather. Um, I remember at school, um, <laughs> you know, I'd learned to swim at a very early age. And it, when I was at school, none of the kids really could swim. And I remember pretending not to be able to swim <laughs> so that people w wouldn't hate me. <laughs> and, um, and I write about that in, in Things I Don't Want to Know, that if they filled the swimming pool with tea, everyone would put their head under water <laughs> in England. So I have a great love for, for Britain. I have a great conflict with it. I, I cannot bear Brexit. Um, I have a great love for the language and the dialects. I live some of the time in Paris now and sometimes I just long to hear the way somebody says no or mm. <laughs> you know um, so has it changed from the child's view of nine? Yes, I think it has um, but there is always this feeling that um, I do like the sun. Very much love. Today, I was walking around with my publisher, and any time we saw the sun, we just put our faces in it. You know. Um, so, so this is all written about in things I don't want to know. That's the book no one can say the title of. And the things we don't want to know are the things we know anyway but we repress, right? So, so it's a bit like a bill coming in. Uh, you, you sort of slip it under, you slip it under something else, but you know it's there. Um. Any more? Yeah, um, how was the process of uh, writing non-fiction and fiction? In yeah. Parallel? about writing non-fiction and fiction the in difference. parallel. In parallel. How was the process and how did you navigate these two dimensions and what was the escape from what? Was fiction the escape from non-fiction or the other way around? Yeah. Oh, well, it's a good question. I ask myself this a lot too. <laughs> Any ideas? <laughs> um, so in fiction, there's not that much difference, in fact. Um, in fiction, we have avatars, characters, who are our avatars, to speak for us. Um, so to carry our arguments um, and our interests and preoccupations. Uh, writing the living autobiography, I had to create um, a narrator who's very like myself, 
but not quite myself. I had to find a voice for her that I could live with across three books and that I hope you can live with. <laughs> um, and so I needed to find a voice that wasn't grander than I am or more modest than I am or a, a voice that is powerful but is also vulnerable. A lot of things coexisting together. Uh, a lot of contradictions, somehow coexisting in one voice, which is all of us, because we all have that. We can feel very, very good on Monday and not so good on Wednesday, right? So how do you find a voice for that? That was the non-fiction challenge. Um, at the same time, um, you're kind of still building a world in both, in non-fiction and, and in fiction. You have to compose it. Um, and then don't forget that the only interesting thing about writing is what we pay attention to. So you can have a writer who has beautiful sentences, but what they're looking at and how they're looking at it might not interest me or you, right? So it's so. We uh, we are only as interesting as how we think. If we haven't, you know, if if we sometimes we're just really bored with how somebody thinks. Think, oh no, oh just no, not that again. Um, but if there are enough dimensions. Um, if there's enough coherence and enough incoherence, very important. Because if we just have coherent books with no struggle for meaning, why am I feeling this? Why, why does that bottle of water make me feel sad? Um, if there are no problems, um, then we then then we kind of bored. For my generation, um, one of the things that um, I think we I struggled with was that it was supposed to be men who did all the thinking, and it was women who did all the feeling. We thought, well, no. What does an intellectual woman do with that that stereotype? Yeah, this is this is going right back. So you had to be brave and do both. Just not react to things like I know I'm gonna just gonna I'm just gonna do very coherent, clear, lucid thinking. So there's no thinking without feeling, no feeling without thinking. And when there's an absence, when there's too much feeling and not enough thinking, that's a problem in fiction and non-fiction. And if there's too much thinking and no feeling, that's a problem. Do. So, you know, someone like Nietzsche is very good at both. Whatever you think of Nietzsche, he was very good at doing both of those things. Um, and as far as I know, it wasn't fiction. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one last question. Um, I want to ask you, how do you manage not to give up writing? How do you not give up writing? Yeah. Good, another good question. Um, I just don't think I could. I think I, I think I would be so unhappy, really. Even having just finished a book where you think I'm never going to write another one again. That was so hard. That was such a struggle. Um, so it's one of the things in art that can't be explained away. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know, except that it's something that um, I seem to have to do. Thank you. I want to thank um, all of you for your excellent questions. Um, and I want to thank Deborah for her excellent answers. Um, Marlon Hertler for her outstanding translation. Veronika Bachfischer for, for the amazing reading. 
Lilian Astrid Giese for translating this evening. Janika Janika Gelinek. This is why I write it down. Uh, for, for taking us through this evening and her colleagues, Sonia Longolio, Sabina Büdel, Evelina Kraftmann. Um, what a wonderful group of women uh, has put on this evening tonight. You can buy a Schöne Mutanten here this evening. I believe Deborah will sign it for you. And I wish you all a wonderful rest of the night. And thank you, Katie.